Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. And over these five weeks, as we thought about stewardship, our response to what you've entrusted and blessed us with, uh, Lord, we pray that you continue to move in our hearts, uh, that we be a community marked by generosity and sacrifice for one another. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Oh, please be seated. Well, I really actually enjoy preaching series that lets us think deeply about a particular theme, particular part of scripture over several weeks, and I really think that actually grows our depth. Uh, sometimes on a Sunday, if we just touch something once, I think sometimes it's a little hard for it to really sink in. But for us, we've been going through these five weeks thinking about stewardship. And we thought about this funny word because it's not often used, but really how do we wisely and ethically use the things at our disposal? We've talked about our time, our talents, our treasure, or all the different blessings God has given us. And so today we've come to the conclusion of our five weeks, and I've been excited to be preparing this and having uh, just kind of soaked in this topic, in this mindset. What is stewardship, and how do we respond to God? How do we live with Christians, as Christians, on this very important topic? Well, let's do a bit of a recap again. Our very first sermon was called Dollars, Cents, and Hearts, and we're reminded that Jesus does not shy away from talking about money. In fact, uh, today again, we read that theme passage where Jesus actually tells us you cannot worship God and money. It matters a lot, and Jesus is very blunt about that. But Jesus doesn't so much talk about dollars and cents only. He's actually very interested in our hearts. Who will we worship really is the question when Jesus says, you cannot serve God and money. Who will we serve? Who will we worship? And so that's where we began, and we realized we should not underestimate the power money can have over our hearts. In part two, we looked at the Old Testament, uh, before Jesus' ministry on earth. Um, how do we understand stewardship when we talked about time, talent, and treasure? Whose is it? And we were reminded that a fundamental worldview for Christians is that everything belongs to God. We may think our bank account is in our name, our car is in our name, our degrees are in our name, that uh, my day book and my diary all 24 hours are mine, but actually a truer Christian understanding is that God has entrusted those things to us. And we have no way to do this, but it would be quite a, a thing if all our bank account statements came in and they said, from God, entrusted to you. I think we would, in fact, think differently. So we are challenged to change our mindset about whose is it? Who does it belong to? And when we did that, we looked at the Old Testament, and we realized, oh, for in the Old Testament, God actually commanded his people to give 10% to the priests and the temple ministry. But that wasn't just that. Yes, there was a, a commandment, a black and white rule, but there are all sorts of other occasions where God encouraged the generosity of his people and it wasn't so strictly about a 10% number, but there was, in the Old Testament times, a black and white rule about 10%. So we thought, well, if that's what happens in the first half of Scripture in a way, then we said, what should we do in looking at the New Testament? So weeks three and four, we looked at a very, very real-life example. And we realized there were Christians in the city of Corinth, and they thought about being generous, but now they weren't so sure about it anymore. And so Paul really wanted to encourage them. And he didn't use a number with them. He didn't say, hey, there's a black and white rule of 10%. Instead, he reminded them, you should be a cheerful giver, and you should meditate and think in your heart what you want to give and realize this actually blesses very real people. It's not a theoretical idea to be generous, but generosity always takes a very real-life situation. And so today is now part five, and you might still be wondering, well, Alan, I'm still very curious. This is a New Testament tell us exactly how we should give or how much we should give? We'll get to that. But part five, I've entitled simply, Christ, the giver. That is, we think about Jesus, and I'll be preaching from the passage read by Tavona from Philippians. We think about who Jesus Christ is. I think one way we can understand his identity is that he is the giver. So let's look back at our Philippians passage. And my first point that we see here is that Paul's going to repeat again and again, if there is any, any so-and-so and so-and-so and so, then he wants to draw us somewhere from there. So in our beginning of my passage, Paul writes, if there's any encouragement, any comfort, any partic participation, 
any affection and sympathy. Well, let's see what he's going on about here. So in our passage, at the very beginning, Paul writes, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. What's Paul going on when I keep repeating, hey, if there's any this, any this, any that? He's trying to build up quite a strong argument. He's being quite rhetorical in this way. He's saying, look, if you have any encouragement in Christ, and ideally Christians would have some encouragement in who Jesus is, um, if you have any comfort from love, God's love, other people's love, if you have any participation in spirit, any affection and sympathy at all, do you kind of see what Paul's doing here? He's sort of saying, hey, if you even have 1% of something, I want you to realize something very, very important. Because for Christians, we do have a great encouragement in Christ of knowing his love and sacrifice from us. We do have a great comfort knowing that God loved us and created us. When we are baptized, when we're confirmed, we are given the Holy Spirit, we do have participation in the Holy Spirit. If we have any affection and sympathy, now, now Paul's going a bit low. You know, if you're a human being and you have any affection and sympathy, please. <laughs> you might think, oh, Paul's really layering it on thick here. Oh, Paul, what are you trying to get at? Oh, Paul really is drawing us into argument. You say, well, complete my joy. Paul's saying, I actually would be so blessed and filled with joy if what's going to happen, he's still going here, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. So now he's saying to all the people he's writing to, if you have any of these things, would you learn to be of one accord and one mind? And then he's going to warn us not to do certain things. He's going to say, do not be selfish, do not be conceited, but instead be humble, counting other people more significant than yourselves and actually being considerate. And this we see, let not... Let each of you not look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This is an argument he's building up, okay? If you have any of these things, any of these things, do not do this, do not do this. Basically saying, if you're a Christian, <laughs> if you're a Christian in any regard, and that is going to be a big then, okay? So if there is any, and he's building this case over and over again, he lists like eight things in a row, where is he going with this? Then what? Then be like Christ. What's going to complete Paul's joy as he writes to these believers is to actually be like Christ. And he'll say, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Look at the second part of this passage. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Now, if you're a, a Christian, a baptized believer, actually the most common term we use nowadays is Christian. But sometimes I feel that word actually loses its meaning. You're like, oh, are you Christian? You're not a Christian. Oh, I listen to Christian music. Oh, I read a Christian book. Before the term Christian existed, actually, was the term disciple. If someone said, I am learning to follow Jesus, a disciple longs to be like their master, like their teacher. So someone who is a disciple of whoever, of Plato, is seeking to live their life, understand the teachings, and fully uh, be an example of the person they are a disciple of. And so because I think our term Christian can be just overused a bit today, maybe it's helpful for us to think about, for us who are following Jesus, we are disciples of him. I think it would feel quite different if, say, if a friend who didn't know you are a believer said, oh, tell me a bit about yourself, you said, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I think that can sound a little more serious than just saying, I'm a Christian. Well, hopefully Christian can capture that meaning also. But for today's purpose, sometimes it can help to talk about it a different way. And before the word Christianity existed, so before the word Christian existed, people were called disciples. Before the word Christianity was thought of, people would simply refer to it as the way. There was a way to live your life that was so different that it was modeled after this incredible person, Jesus Christ, that is known as the way. And I love what I love about that is it's very clear that that's a path you walk. It's a lifestyle. It's a decision and a commitment to walk in the way. 
So what Paul's saying is learn to be like Christ. If you are a disciple of Jesus, learn to be like him. Walk in the way. And what do we find out about the way Jesus was? This is what he says. Jesus, though he was in the form of God, that is, we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is right up there of the same um, essence, uh, our one creator God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That he didn't treat it like that. Oh, I'm God when he showed up on earth. Instead, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. What he's saying there is although Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, when he showed up on earth, he was not boastful or proud about it. He was not selfish about it. Instead, Jesus lowered himself to serve you and I, to humbly teach you and I, to love you and I, and ultimately, as we have this large cross uh, hanging from our church ceiling here, is Jesus shows the ultimate emptying of himself by going to the cross for you and I. Jesus did not come to take from us one of the essence of Jesus' character and of God is that he is a giver. And so as I did with the children, you might think, oh, when we do offering, is it weird that God wants, is God wanting to take from us? And so we all put an offering in the bag. That would be a, a misguided way to think about it. When we think about stewardship, and as we wrap up this whole series, we come back to the person of who Jesus is, to be like Christ and realize this Jesus emptied himself, giving himself for us. Now, for some of you who've been in church for a long time, you know this. From ever since maybe you're a little kid in Sunday school, you know, oh, Jesus died for my sins, and you've heard it many times. Maybe for some of you, you've been exploring the faith later in your life, and you're still like, oh, only not so recently was I told that Jesus gave his life for me, that he died for me. And this can be quite a new thing for you. Well, regardless of which of those two camps you are in, um, I want to give uh, some of you guys time to share. And we've been doing this through the series. is actually dividing into a bit of small group discussion. And so uh, I'm going to put up a couple questions in a little while. But I want us in these groups to actually be able to reflect on this amazing mystery that Jesus, the King of King of Lord of Lords, when he came among us, chose to lower himself before us. It is the mystery of the cross, and regardless of how long you've been a Christian, uh, it is something to hear and share with one another once again what exactly that means, okay? So let me put up the discussion questions here. Oh, oh don't tell me I have that slide out of order. Okay, uh, so I'm going to encourage you to divide into groups of three and four. Feel free to get up. Again, I've, I've said this before. You may have be sitting with your family. You have no obligation to remain in discussion group with your family. Feel free to get up and stand and move and mingle. I give you permission to do that. And here are the two questions I'd like you to talk about. How do you understand the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for you? What feelings or thoughts does it evoke for you personally? Okay. So I don't want you to give the good Sunday school answer, oh, it shows Jesus loves me. Yes. I actually want you to reflect personally. If you were to describe, what does it mean that Jesus went to sacrifice on the cross for you and I? And if that's something that's quite new to you, that's okay if you want to pass and just listen to the rest of your group share about that. And then secondly, what we see in our passage is interesting, is that what does it mean to you that Jesus lowered himself and that God the Father then lifted and exalted him? Let me show you that just very briefly. At the end of our passage, it says, therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on Jesus the name that is above every name. So in our passage, we see Jesus empty himself, lower himself, and then God lifts him up. So I want to encourage you to spend uh, just about uh, maybe five to seven minutes in some groups. Uh, Some of you guys often sit in the same area, so maybe you like to be in the same group you have in in the past weeks, or maybe you like to get up and move around a little bit. But do enjoy some time to talk and share with each other, and I'll leave these slides up here. So go to it.
You might want to shift a little bit to the second question if you haven't. Uh, I know it sounds like some really wonderful sharing, but we do have limited time. So if you haven't talked about the second question, maybe look at it a bit. Just two more minutes. All right, just as your last person finished up sharing, if you don't mind returning to your seats, and we'll continue the sermon in a moment. Uh, well, I hope everyone was blessed by hearing the sharings of others. You know, um, uh, when we ta our group talked a little bit about, uh, I think, Jesus' sacrifice it's, it's an, this enormous thing that actually I think if you talk to other Christians, uh, just like this cross, you might see it from different angles. There's uh, too much for one eye or one heart or one mind to really take in about the loving sacrifice and mystery of Jesus going to the cross. So it's always a blessed thing to actually talk with other people and say, what do you see? What touches your heart as you think about the loving sacrifice of Jesus on the cross? And so there is an unfathomable mystery about it. And I, I want to kind of build on that as we go, a particular area for the second question, when we think about Jesus lowering himself and then somehow being exalted. So let's talk a little bit about that. One thing that we see in our passage as Paul saying, okay, if you have any of this, any of this, any of this, be like Jesus. What does he say about what Jesus does and what I would describe this as is as the backwards movement of the gospel. Jesus emptied himself Jesus is king of kings, lord and lords. What is it saying? Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of servant, being obedient to the point of death. And then what happens? God then exalts him. The gospel is backwards to what we would naturally think as human beings. Particularly in Canada, I think the Canadian dream is that your lifestyle always improves. 
So if you're, some of you guys are signing up for university and you're like thinking about student loans or like, oh, I don't, I'm not going to have any income. You're like, oh, if your standard of living starts here, don't worry. In Canada, the Canadian dream is you build on it. And the car you drive will improve. The house you live in will improve. Your stature and your respect, your career will improve. And so our human instincts want our lives to look like this. The gospel is different. There's good news and there's bad news. And Paul says, be like Christ, but don't get it wrong. When they say be like Christ, understand the path that Jesus walked was not the path like this, the so-called Canadian dream. Jesus' path involved downward movement. Downward movement is a a phrase I've heard many Christians use in devotionals, and I, I really am drawn to this that often our human instincts always wants upward movement. I want upward movement. I want to see my stocks go up. I want to grow in character. Even, even as a Christian, we can still think in upward movement. I want to grow in my spirituality. They're not bad things to want. But somehow, the Christian journey is that death leads to life. Humility leads to being exalted. Lowering ourselves allows God to lift us up. Because our human nature wants to do it ourselves. I want to lift myself up. I want to be good. I want to grow by my own might. And Jesus' great glory that he's given, where the angels cry, holy, 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 before the throne, is because Jesus lowered himself, actually. He is the lamb who is worthy. He was the lamb that was slain for us. I think this is such a, a paradoxic, but such an important point, and particularly for us who enjoyed the English Congregation Retreat yesterday. That was a highlight for me. I have to say, in my last four or five years, I think that was the most joyful gathering I can see amongst our brothers and sisters. And I have nothing to say bad about it in that sense. (laughs) There's only one danger for those of us who enjoyed the English Congregation Retreat, is that it's incomplete. So some of you who weren't there, uh, we, uh, after the last four years of being disconnected and COVID and many things, uh, we organized English Congregation Retreat. There were uh, 51 of us there, uh, if you count the babies, and we enjoyed a day where there's meal sharing, there are times of talking, sharing. We had a drum circle. We did different activities led by different people, uh, and I could see by the end of the day, hearts were filled with joy, and that's a wonderful thing to enjoy that. The only risk is that it's incomplete. Because we see the example of Christ is that, yes, there's wonderful moments and great, enjoy great joy, but when you look at the cross of Jesus, it shows the real cost of what it means to love other people, difficult people, what sacrifice it means to actually show that love, what type of commitment it has. And that's what we see in the life of Jesus. When push comes to shove, And the other thing our group talked about is, you know, uh, Jesus didn't just instantly die on the cross. There was a whole path of betrayal, shaming, insult, torture, etc. And we all admitted as human beings, we would have said we've had enough at some point. But one thing I'm touched by is Jesus' intention and commitment to show his act of love and sacrifice through to the end. And so I hope coming out of the joy of English Congregation Retreat yesterday, is also the challenge for us to follow the actual example of Christ, to go down the path of humility, of emptying ourselves, of serving one another, and knowing that when we do that, the mystery of the gospel is that God's heart is delighted in seeing that humility, and he is the one to lift us up, not ourselves, that God is the one to exalt us. We don't need to be an influencer promoting ourselves. If we were to think about it, the influencer culture is exactly opposite So the path Jesus took of emptying himself, that God may lift him up. And what does that mean for you and I is that whatever suffering you and I face on this earth, we need to have a long-term vision of God's promises that once again, we will be raised in glory. And each week when we recite the creed, we say, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. I believe that Christ will come again. That whatever shame and humility and suffering and downward movement we may experience in our lives, and for some of us it may be great, there is something else on the other side. And in fact, spoiler alert, no matter how much wealth, time, talent, and treasure we have, we actually all do lose it. 
one way or another, as we age, as we are ill, as we give up of our earthly lives. So our, our series of stewardship, in fact, is to think, how do we be humble, obedient givers back to God? And so how do I start to wrap up uh, this whole series of five weeks on stewardship is really to come back to Jesus as we look at his life and who he is. And you still might say, well, Alan, are you going to give me a number or not? I like to be black and white about things. Alan, give me a Christian principle of what it means to give. You told me in the Old Testament times there was a 10% rule, but that was plus and minus all these other occasions to give. And now you've said in the New Testament there's not a clear principle. And in fact, last week we looked at this verse, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you. Some of you who would like to just summarize the last five weeks and say, okay, Alan, let's give us something simple. Are you going to tell me a number or not? Um, in my spare time, sometimes I enjoy reading a website called Reddit, and there's an area called Ask Reddit where people can discuss interesting topics and people give advice on things. And there was one uh, interesting thread that said, uh, married people, what advice would you give to people who aren't married yet? And, you know, people write their different comments, and you can vote for comments, so the best advice, ideally, or the funniest advice ends up at the top <laughs> often. And I, being a, a someone married, and if you're not married, I think it's a very interesting thread, so I remember clicking on it, and this is what one of the comments said. It said, marriage isn't 50-50. That is, maybe when we're about to get married, we think, okay, it's about division of labor and things like that. So if you do laundry, I'll do the dishes. You know, if you do this, I'll do that. Marriage isn't 50-50. It's 100-100. I remember reading this and being really struck by it. Because as human beings, <laughs> we can want to protect ourselves and look out for number one. So we want to set a rule. Hey, 50-50. You spent an hour on chores? Then maybe I'll spend an hour on chores. But... Why do I struggle to give you guys a number? Because a relation with God is not about a contractual number. What does 100 and 100 mean? That describes two people who are all in. That describes a relationship of love where people are not going to count, oh, you did 10 minutes extra of chores, or I did 10 minutes of extra chores and you didn't. I'm going to notice that. A, a loving relationship is completely different. And I remember thinking about how deep this advice was, and then I thought about, if even in marriage we ought to live 100 and 100, what is our relationship with God? And this is why numbers will fail us. In the Old Testament, you say, oh, there's a 10% rule, but God was interested in his people being all in with him. And so I want to describe to you, uh, when we talked about our time, talent, and treasure, did I say, oh, only 10% of your time belongs to God, or 10% of your treasure? No, there's something deeper for us to know is that Jesus has given of himself to us, and I don't think Jesus counted a number. Well, okay, there's all these sinful people on earth. I'll give 9% of my love, and let's see what they'll give back to me. Jesus is a giver, and his heart is so good that he is all in, in his love, in his relationship to us. In the same way, two spouses might come to a place, uh, or two people... Uh, might enter into marriage in a place of love and say, yes, I'm 100% in with you. Our brothers and sisters, learning to be a Christian is to give of our hearts back to God and say, God, I want to love you with all my heart, soul, and mind. That's, a, that's the word, all. That's 100%. And it's not even about a number then. It is about being all in in our relation with God. It is something total. And that is where we come back to Jesus. We understand his giving to us was total. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by you, by his poverty, might become rich. Stewardship is primarily a response to Jesus, understanding that Jesus is in 100%, and so if he is our Lord and Savior, we are his disciples walking in his way. How do we learn to love? by looking at how Jesus loved? How do we learn to live? By looking at how Jesus taught us. How do we learn to pray? By seeing Jesus' prayer, the Lord's prayer. And how will we learn to be stewards? How will we learn to give? By the sacrificial example of Christ.
That's how we'll learn our stewardship is by looking at Jesus. And what did Jesus offer? As we come in Holy Communion, I'm not sure if you ever saw Holy Communion as Jesus' time of offering. Yes, on a Sunday morning, we have an official time of offering. I mean, we offer our praise, we offer our prayers, but there is a time of offertory where we pass around a bag and we give. Have you ever realized that actually when we celebrate Holy Communion, we are remembering someone else's offering? We're remembering what Jesus offered to us. What did he give? And so before we receive, we hear Jesus' words, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you. And so this is a holy table, but it is also a table of offering. Or as we come before, we realize our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he is the ultimate giver who gives of his body and blood, and may we respond in Christian stewardship. Amen.